I'm Ollie Wright. I'm a dev tech with NVIDIA, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the engineers working on Minecraft with RTX. This is going to be a short 30 minute introduction to real time ray tracing. We'll touch on a few topics, and we'll go into some detail on how we produce an image using ray tracing, and how we can do nice things like per pixel global illumination. So, what is ray tracing? You might have seen something like this explanation before where if you think of rasterization as having an outer loop where you loop over all the triangles in a scene and then the hardware can tell you which pixels each triangle touches and color them in. Then ray tracing has an outer loop that loops over all the pixels on the screen and then the hardware figures out which triangle it touches and then you color it in. But that doesn't really answer the question or it's the wrong question. What we want to know is, why should we care about ray tracing? What can it do to make my game better? And the simple answer to that is it can make really nice pictures. We can go from something like this to something like this. And I'm going to use this image a lot later on because I like it. Uh, and without ray tracing, this kind of image would be tricky to produce, or without offline baking, really. You have things like a nice, subtle, soft shadow behind this pillar. And the shadow's not cast from any direct light source, it's cast from these openings here, which are just letting in some daylight, and there's another one that's hidden behind the column. And also you get things like the, the ceiling here by the entrance is brighter, just naturally. We can have things like coloured shadows by tracing through semi-transparent materials and keeping track of the transmission colour. And we can have reflections that can reflect things that are not on the screen. Now a reasonable chunk of this talk will be about global illumination, and specifically per pixel global illumination. So first I want to talk a little bit about ambient occlusion and how it differs from global illumination. And a lot of you probably have a pretty good idea about what ambient occlusion is. It's the thing that makes corners and crevices dark, but what is it really? Ambient occlusion asks the question, how much can a point see the ambient light, or how much ambient light can get to a point? But it has nothing to say about what the ambient light is, where it's coming from. The simplest form of AO will use the sky as ambient light. So AO's question is, how much can a point see the sky? How is the, is the sky visible? But games which are inside buildings or in rooms, the sky is now good. So they will use light probes maybe to, um, to, to encode what the ambient light is. But whatever the source of the ambient light is, ambient occlusion is used to attenuate it when it estimates that some of the ambient light is blocked. Now global illumination on the other hand is concerned with what is the light that is falling onto a point. What are the local lighting conditions? In Minecraft, we try to get close to per pixel global illumination using ray tracing, in much the same way that most ambient occlusion techniques are done per pixel. And this actually makes the whole thing quite simple. By having per pixel GI, we don't need ambient occlusion. It's already doing that job and more. It solves the problem directly and it can produce some nice results. So this picture nicely demonstrates some of this. It's a cave with a hole in the roof. There's, um, the only light sources here are the sky and the sun. So you've got this patch of ground here. This is directly lit by the sun, so it's nice and bright. Whereas this patch on the floor, maybe it's not directly lit by the sun, but it can see the sky through the hole, so it's getting direct lighting from the sky. 
if you like. And then areas here, this bit can't see the hole in the roof at all. So it can't see the sky or the sunlight. So it's shadows. But what's going on up here? On the ceiling, this part of the ceiling also can't see the hole in the roof. So we can't see the sky or the sun, but it's still lit. And it's lit from the balanced light from this area on the ground. If you were to put yourself up there, you would see this has been quite a bright patch. So there's light coming from there and that's illuminating the ceiling. We actually have enough detail that you can see some shadows from this bright area here. And here's another example where you can see light bouncing. You can also see the opposite of ambient occlusion as well. This, this area here or this area here, the corners aren't darker, they're brighter because the light is bouncing very close. So let's backtrack a little bit and go back to basics. What does ray tracing hardware through an API like DXR give us? Well, it just tells you what, what a ray has hit, what triangle, what object. It doesn't tell you what color it is. But for most of this talk, I'm going to assume the existence of some magic code that lets us ask what the incoming radiance is from any point in any direction. Or if I put it, if I put myself in a particular position in the world and look in a particular direction, what color do I see? Now remember that ray tracing hardware just tells us what surface the ray has hit. And our magic code then will figure out all the lighting for that point, shade the surface and calculate what the radiance is coming back along the ray that we're asking for. Now, of course, if this actually existed, we could just use this for all our primary camera rays, ask it what the color is coming along each camera ray. And that's our image finished. Um, so just go with me on this. This is cheating. Uh, but I promise I will circle back at the end and we'll explain what we actually do. Oops. So let's start simple. We'll do the ray tracing equivalent of deferred shading. So we start with a G buffer and you could use rasterization to write the G buffer. In Minecraft we use ray tracing, but it doesn't matter. And then we're going to use ray tracing to shade each of the pixels in the G buffer. We can do this by shooting a lot of rays from the surface of each pixel in the, in the G buffer in random directions using the hemisphere described by the surface normal. Now remember we're cheating so that each ray we shoot, it can tell us what the color is coming from that direction, what the light is. Each ray is one sample of incoming light. And for each ray, we're just going to do very simple Lambert diffuse shading, just plain N dot L. And in this case, L, the light direction, is the direction of the ray that we're sampling because we are literally sampling the light from that direction. And then we just average the results for lots of rays and you have the results for the pixel. Repeat for all the pixels and you have an image. So how many random rays does it take to make a nice image? We'll keep things simple. We'll just do simple, simple Lambertian n dot L lighting for each sample and we'll see what we get. So here's a reference image of what we're trying to achieve. And this is what it would look like, excuse me, if we had a lot of samples, shoot a lot of rays for each pixel. Now, just to be clear, this is pure Lambert shading, just diffuse only. So this is with a single ray per pixel, and we wouldn't really expect this to look very good. And it doesn't, it's very noisy as you might expect, because each pixel is sampling light from a different random direction to its neighbors. There's two rays, four rays, eight, 16. Now at 16 rays per pixel, we can kind of see what the image would look like if we, if we squint a little bit, but it's still very noisy. 
256, and I'm going to stop there because here we are at now more than half a billion rays for a single 1080p image and it's still not very good, it's still noisy here and on the floor. So the problem is we need a lot of rays to make a good image, far too many to be practical. So how do we do better? So first I'm going to introduce a concept called importance sampling. Now, importance sampling is quite a simple idea, but it can get complicated quickly. To start with, we're just going to shoot rays completely randomly. Now, if you're going to shoot random rays, it's important to make sure that they are uniformly random. It's easy to come up with a function that generates a random point on a hemisphere that you can then use as a direction. But you have to be very careful to make sure that it really is uniform. So here's a function that does generate a uniform distribution. And that uniform distribution looks like this. It, it looks uniform. So with importance sampling, the idea is that instead of shooting rays, <coughs> excuse me, instead of shooting rays in completely random directions, you can do better if you can shoot more rays in directions that are more useful, fewer rays in directions that are less useful. But that on its own isn't enough you have to balance the books. If you don't balance the books, then you will have biased results, and that means incorrect lighting. And to balance the books, you have to be able to calculate an appropriate weight for each ray, so that the directions that are less likely have larger weights to compensate. And I will try and illustrate this with a completely contrived example. <clears throat> so here's a hemisphere with a uniform random distribution of directions. Now let's imagine that, for whatever reason, we want to shoot twice as many rays to the left than the right, because we know there are more useful things in that direction. We can easily do that by making some simple changes to the 2D random numbers before converting to a hemisphere coordinate like this. So don't worry too much about this code. All it's doing is it's taking the middle third range of numbers, so from 0.33 to 0.67, and it's stretching that out to occupy at half, so 0.25 to 0.75, and then squishing in the outer thirds. And the result is this. So now this is biased. Light from the left will have twice as much influence as light from the right, because there are twice as many samples there. So we need to balance the books, and we can do this by adjusting the weights so that samples to the right have twice the weight as samples on the left. And we can show this on the picture by adjusting the area of the blobs. But we need to be very careful that the average weight is still one, and here this isn't the case. If we have three samples, one in each third, then you can see that the average weight is actually four over three, because we've got weights of one, one, and two. So that means to correctly normalize, to, to correctly rebalance this, we need to multiply all the weights by three over four, like this. Now it's balanced again. So that's a completely valid, but completely useless example of importance sampling. So how about a less contrived example, something a little bit more useful? Now probably the simplest form of importance sampling that's actually useful is called cosine weighted sampling. And this uses the fact that rays at shallow angles to a surface are less important because of the cosine rule, n dot l. Cosine weight, weighted sampling bunches the samples more towards the surface normal. So there are fewer samples taken at grazing angles, and more samples taken at angles that are more important. 
but it also calculates an appropriate weight for the samples so that the result remains unbiased. Like this. So an interesting side effect of this is the weight that it calculates is proportional to 1 over n dot l. So as an, n, an extra benefit, you can cancel out the n dot l from the lighting calculation. So what does this do to our image? Well, it makes it better. It reduces the noise. So this is the 16 sample per pixel image. You can see with the uniform random distribution, we have a lot more noise in this area than we do with the cosine weighted distribution. But it's not fixed it. It's not perfect. It's better for the same number of rays. So what we'd really like to do is be able to do something that gets us down to one sample per pixel. And we're not there yet. Now, important sampling gets really useful and really complicated when you start looking at specular distributions. Now, these are more complicated because there are more parameters. A cosine weighted distribution is fixed, but specular distributions change with things like the view direction and surface roughness. In Minecraft, we use a distribution, uh, a distribution called VNDF which works remarkably well and is, is, fun, is way better than doing random sampling. So continuing with this problem of how to get good images with a small number of samples leads to my next topic. So denoising is an umbrella term for a family of techniques that really make ray tracing, real-time ray tracing possible. As the name suggests, denoising techniques try to take a noisy signal and make it not noisy, all while, while maintaining as much detail as possible. Denoise, denoising is grounded in a couple of reasonably obvious principles. The pixels that are close to one another often have very similar lighting environments. Often, not always. And the surfaces represented by pixels in the world often have similar lighting environments between frames. So denoising tries to share lighting samples between pixels and between frames where appropriate. And this can effectively increase the number of samples, the number of lighting samples available for a pixel by a, a lot. But choosing what we're going to denoise is very important. Now you might think that we could just denoise the final image, but that would actually be extremely challenging. If we're going to denoise the final image, then to avoid just having a blurred mess, the denoiser would have to skip pixels that have a different surface color. So it would have to be able to look at pixels next to each other and say, okay, well, this is different, so I can't share the sample. And that would severely restrict how many samples pixels can share because the colors are changing all the time on a surface. So what if we denoise the incoming irradiance instead? We take the surface color out of the equation. So this signal is a lot smoother now because we don't need to worry about all the detail in the surface color. So you can see that there are a lot more opportunities for denoising, blurring, lots of large flat surfaces. Like you can imagine blurring across all of this area here, and that would work well. But we still have surface normals in normal maps. And these present a discontinuity for the denoiser. So we have a choice, again, of either blurring across them in which case we will just lose all of the detail in the normal maps. Or we make the denoiser kernel stop when it sees a normal discontinuity, a change in normal. But if we do that, we'll have fewer samples again that the denoiser can work with. So we'll, be, we'll have a noisier image. So again, we're left with this choice. If we stick with this thing that we're going to denoise, we have a choice between blurring normal maps 
or more noise. So in Minecraft, we use a simple form of spherical harmonics to store the irradiance for the diffuse lighting. And doing this allows us to sample the incoming light using the geometry normal instead of the surface normal. And then the spherical harmonics allow us to recover an estimate of the radiance around the surface normal later on in the final lighting pass. So this has the significant advantage that the denoiser now doesn't need to be tripped up by surface normal changes. We have a much larger, sorry, we have much larger smooth areas that the denoiser can work across. So now the whole floor here, you can imagine blurring across the whole floor and the whole of this column and these columns. Let's do that. In Minecraft we use a version of a technique called SVGF, which stands for Spatiotemporal Variance Guided Filtering for the Diffuse Denoising. And the special source in this technique is the Variance Guided bit. SVGF is a big blur, but it's a blur that is geometry aware. So it won't blur across geometric boundaries. And this aspect of the algorithm has been heavily customized for Minecraft because in Minecraft, all the geometry is made up of planar surfaces. So the logic to determine if pixels are part of the same surface can be simplified. Now the image here is what we get when we apply the SVGF blur kernel to our diffuse spherical harmonics, but without using the variance guiding. If we convert this back to a diffuse irradiance color, then it's easier to visualize. Now the problem here is that the blur has eaten away a ton of detail in the shadow, resulting in some really nasty Peter Panning for this column. The, the column looks like it's floating. But SVGF uses the statistical variance of the luminance to guide the blur kernel weights. So it blurs more when it can and less when there is more detail going on. And the results are amazing. So now the Peter Panin has almost entirely gone. And I think this is remarkable. I think this is amazing to think that you can get a result like this from one sample per pixel. So again, there are some, there will be some links at the end to read more about SVGF. This is just a high level overview. So now all we need to do is bring all the elements together to produce a final image. So now we can use the surface normals again and ask the spherical harmonics what the irradiance is in the direction of the surface normals. Then we can bring in the diffuse color to apply the Lambertian diffuse. So that's our final diffuse denoised image. And then we bring in everything else that we haven't talked about yet, like the specular pass. I promised that I would justify my use of blatant cheating. Remember, we want to be able to ask what the radiance is from any point in any direction. Well, to answer that, we need to know that we need to know what array in that direction hits. And then we need to know all about the lighting conditions at that point so that we can evaluate the surface shader and figure out the radiance back along the original ray. So how do we know what the lighting is at this new point? Well, we can shoot some rays. And now we're back to where we started. The problem is recursive. Now, offline path tracing solves this recursive problem by doing just that. It shoots rays recursively and it keeps going until a fixed recursion depth is reached, or the ray hits a purely emissive surface, a light source. It's extremely effective, but also extremely expensive. And, but we can get quite good results by cheating. In Minecraft, we use irradiance caches to move those additional bounces into a background process that bounces rays over time. 
we actually store outgoing irradiance in geometry data per face. And we update it over time by continually shooting rays in the background to refine the estimate and keep up with any lighting changes like the movement of the sun. And it looks crude, but it's used when we're sampling random diffuse rays. And even then, this version of the cache is only used for rays that hit quite far away. For closer rays, we have a more detailed cache. Here we cache incoming irradiance per vertex and use that along with the diffuse albedo and any self-emissive properties to get a more accurate estimate. But the point of these caches is that they are extremely cheap to look up and they give us a good estimate when we want to ask what is the radiance from this point and in this direction. So that's the cheating that we do. There is one more topic that I want to introduce, and that's the problem with small, bright things. Just to be clear, when I'm talking about small things, I'm talking about small things in the angular sense. So this cow is small, this cow is far away, but both cows subtend the same angle from the viewer. A random sampling for diffuse irradiance can become problematic when you have small bright things in the scene. The low chance of rays hitting these things, coupled with the high brightness of them, leads to a problem called fireflies. But we want to have things in Minecraft that happen to be small and bright, like torches. So what can we do? We would like lots and lots of small torches, all able to cast shadows. We know random sampling doesn't cut it because they're too small, because of fireflies. What we need is something like importance sampling, but for explicit light sources, something that can guide the rays towards important lights and calculate appropriate weights. So let's think about this for a second. The starting point is to say that let's just sample from every light for every pixel, and this will give us the right answer. But I hope you can see that it's not very practical if you've got more than a few lights. What we'd like from a practical standpoint is to only sample or shoot a ray to a single light for each pixel. Can we do that? If we just choose one light at random, we're choosing one light from n lights, the total number of lights in our scene. So the balancing weight here is n. And for a small number of lights with a good denoiser, this can work well. But can we do better? The difficulty comes from figuring out what constitutes an important light. An imp important lights for one pixel aren't necessarily important for another. How do, you figure that out? How do you figure that out without iterating over all of the lights for every pixel just to figure out which, which ones are the important ones? The technique that we use in Minecraft is effective for maybe a few hundred lights. Each pixel we choose a completely random subset of lights. We choose eight. And then from that subset, we calculate an importance for each one using something like the apparent brightness of the light at the point that we're sampling. And then we pick one of those eight at random, but a weighted random selection using a table of their cumulative importance values. So the chance of a light in the subset being selected is that light's importance divided by the total importance of all eight lights. Now, direct sampling is a very active area of research right now and things are moving very rapidly. So I highly recommend watching Chris Wyman's talk on RTX DI for the current state of the art in sampling from millions of lights. Real-time ray tracing adds many possibilities to what we can do for visuals in games. In this talk, I've barely scratched the surface on a few topics, but there are lots and lots of topics, even just for Minecraft, that I haven't even touched on. And hopefully this has piqued some interest. Maybe you can think about how you can start to add ray tracing to your game. Thank you for watching.